Well, thank you so much, Erica. And thank you all uh, who have joined us here today, kind of back in our Monday routine. And uh, from the looks of things, Scott, it looks like we're also back to our routine of moving the market positively every time we congregate for this. Uh, we will go ahead and plan to do this call again on our normal rotation two weeks from today, which would be after Thanksgiving week. And so it kind of worked out well schedule-wise that next week would be an off week anyways, because I think a lot of you will be out of town and hopefully traveling and, and doing good family things for Thanksgiving next week. Uh, but in the meantime, this is our first uh, call together where we have a lot more clarity and certainty around the election results. Obviously, we did a call together the day after the election, and we were maybe 75% of the way there, but now there, a lot more has moved around those things. So I imagine Scott might be asking me about some of that. And of course, ongoing COVID and vaccine and all sorts of other things. I'm gonna um, just sort of let the questions be what they are. Uh, Scott, I'm sure has his normal uh, set of things to walk through. And then any of you have questions, send them. And I'm gonna do my very best to make this the last call where the email address we're giving out is covid at the bonsongroup.com. By next time, we'll have a different email set up um, for, for uh, you to send in your questions because I'm tired of hearing the word COVID. But um, Scott, off to you, my friend. Well, thank you, David, and great to be with you as always. And to your point, we might as well start off with some of the news we got this morning from Moderna, uh, obviously upbeat, upbeat COVID-19 vaccine news, uh, propelling the Dow closer and closer to that 30,000 mark. And, you know, we haven't heard about Dow 30,000 really since January. And I remember this vividly because I was sitting with you in your Newport Beach uh, office and we were reminiscing on just how close we are to, to Dow 30,000. And obviously uh, we never made it there. Uh, COVID happened and uh, we know we know the rest of that story, but here we are back near that level. So uh, might as well just get your reaction to the vaccine front and kind of what your thinking is there as it pertains to markets. Yeah, I mean, it's the most logical place to start. So it's a, a great question. And, and I certainly remember that, that time with you. It's interesting to think about the fact that when you were out here in our Newport offices, that was technically 2020. And as we're sitting here right now, it's technically 2020. But I don't know about you. It sure feels to me like your visit here was a totally different year from the one that we're all kind of living in. Um, I, I don't want to understate the importance of the announcement. It, it, it's huge, as was last Monday's news where the market was up even bigger. A lot of the vaccine realities already had been kind of priced in, first of all, well before either announcement, and then got even more of a relief around the reality of the announcement last Monday when the BioNTech and Pfizer joint collaboration released their results. And I'm going to talk for a second, if you don't mind, about the difference between the two now that we have the Moderna um, stage three clinical trial results that uh, had been on a preliminary basis released here this morning. Now, the market says, I'm sitting here talking, the Dow's up 320 points. The futures were up 200, um, both when I went to bed last night, when I was up at 3.30 a.m. this morning. And then they did go up to 500 on the positive side when the Moderna announcement came. We're kind of halfway between that now. So it moved the market, but I don't think it moved it huge. But of course, the markets have already been in quite a rally, um, you know, really since October 30th going into Halloween weekend. Uh, the reality of a vaccine coming is one of the biggest reasons. And yet it is not because people think the whole COVID deal is going away immediately. Had there been, I think the expectations from the markets because of the sheer volume of players in generating an effective global society wide vaccine, the markets have had every reason to believe a successful one was going to come out of this potpourri for some time. Having the risk eliminated that all of a sudden you're going to get this kind of surprise disappointment announcement that, oh gosh, in our stage three, it turns out we did have a hundred trial participants get violently ill or, you know, some of that kind of bad news that certainly could come. And what I frankly think is a huge difference marginally 
which is that if we had gotten back that had a 75% efficacy, that would have been great news. And it would have been an approved vaccine that would come out of that. The influenza treatment we have, which is effectively what we call a flu shot, is as low as a 40% efficacy. And in a good year, it might be 60%, but it kind of it stays in that range there. 91 to 92%, which was the Pfizer BioNTech uh, expectation for efficacy last week, is higher than the measles vaccine. Excuse me, it's just a tad lower than the measles vaccine. The Moderna one today at 94 to 95% is higher than the measles vaccine, which obviously we treat the measles vaccination as if it's a universal um, you know, treatment around that. So I really do believe it's very good news. And, and I think that the questions now center more around manufacturing and production. Well, and, and it's interesting because uh, we're also seeing uh, when you look under the hood and we certainly probably saw this more last week, some of the, the work from home stocks, that kind of trade unravel a little bit. Uh, and I'm just curious kind of your, your take there uh, because I know we've talked about overvalued tech stocks for, for many months now on these calls. Yeah, and so I, we should be a little careful. I don't view the FANG and the work from home groups as necessarily the exact same. There's definitely some overlap. I won't go into the exact names, but in that kind of work from home bucket, you have some food delivery names and you have some exercise equipment names that are probably not really thought of as pure big tech, but definitely fit in that kind of work from home. You know, we're sitting here doing this call right now uh, on Zoom technology. And so there's a lot of these things that people are using more and have become more household oriented as a result of the quarantine. Um, but whether we're talking about big tech, FANG or work from home basket, what you have was a whole lot of good news that it got priced in very quickly and seemingly priced in with an expectation of that trajectory staying the same when that trajectory was never very likely to stay the same. Um, I don't think the market's done pricing in the reality that a post-COVID world is not going to look like a pre-COVID world, but it's not going to look like a during COVID world either. And so getting multiples right and getting uh, the earnings right, you know, you have to do both things. You have to put a price to earnings ratio on an earnings number. Well, some of these companies don't have earnings. That makes it difficult. The multiple is going to be a moving target. And then this is the biggest thing I'd say about the quote unquote work from home basket. It's going to become very, very disperse there, much like Fang has, by the way there will be a different response in the marketplace in 2021 for some names versus others based on their own business model evolution, based on their revenue growth and, and based on their ability to transcend a sort of transitory moment of peak homeboundness and instead translate that into a, a kind of broader revenue base across a more normalized economy. So I think it's definitely happening, but I expect more of it. I think a lot of those names are, are quite overvalued. They got more of a, a peak uh, boost in valuation, perhaps from some more speculative investors. And uh, speculative investors can't sustain a market. They can push a market higher. They can create momentum. It can last longer than people, including people like myself think. But speculative investors cannot sustain a market. And I would almost ask people listening to this right now to write that down because that mantra is so important, not just right now here at the end of 2020, but going forward and, and really throughout all of our investing lifetimes. Um, speculative investors cannot sustain a market. That's totally different than me saying they don't influence a market or that they don't uh, uh, create a price premium at a given point in time, but the sustainability is the important part here. And ultimately uh, the fundamentals and revenue growth and the ability to go into something that is more repeatable and then that the market can put a fair price on, those are the things that become sustainable in market pricing. Well, and, and David, uh, to this, this idea of, of strong news, positive news on the vaccine front, coupled with what we're seeing right now on the COVID front, which is rising cases, 
rising positivity rates, even rising hospitalizations. I'll kind of mimic the question you were asked this morning on Bloomberg TV, which is how do you invest with those two worlds? Because I thought it was a great question. And I thought your answer this morning was great. And I figured it'd be worth you repeating your thoughts on, on how to grapple with those two dynamics. Yeah, I think that the um, whole entire issue around COVID case growth uh, remains the same um, as it was the last time we had a kind of um, boost higher in daily cases. Um, now, in this case, the growth of testing is just exponential. And so now what we have is both all the lessons we've learned from the spring moment of COVID and then the summer moment of COVID. And that's in, in the context of an awful lot of increase in testing and the key number has actually not been the hospitalizations, and it's certainly not been the growing number of cases. What the key number has been is the um, very low severities from the growing cases. Then when you get a growth of hospitalizations, you um, versus the summer have a discharge rate coming uh, in half the time that we had, especially through the Florida, Arizona, Texas surges in the summer. And of course, if people are being discharged from the hospital, that means they're obviously not dying. And in fact, not even staying with a severe case of COVID. So that the, the total amount of cases in our country, and, and when you divide the amount of severity or critical cases into that total number, is at an all-time low right now. And that's really encouraging. Um, the, the reason I believe for that is that we're testing an awful lot of asymptomatic or mildly symptomatic people. Uh, we're testing um, well over a million people a day that don't have COVID. Um, we're clearly doing multiple tests on the same person over and over. There is no possible way that over half the people in our country have actually been tested. And uh, so there's a lot of these data things that, that continue to maybe be a little confusing to some in the media. And of course, confusing to a lot of us at home reading it, but are not confusing to the markets that have a kind of profit and loss responsibility to price in the realities around it. Uh, there might be specific pockets here and there. We've heard things in El Paso and other stuff about hospitals, hospitals getting a little um, too close for comfort with capacity. Uh, the ICU wards primarily have not seen any of that. And, and that was some of the fear that it existed in the summer that kind of came and went. Um, so there's really no delicate way to say it. I think the markets just refuse to be fooled again by some of the, the fear mongering that had taken place in past renditions of, of where we are with this. But then when you bring up the vaccine, I think that brings up a more, a more important point just to the kind of reality of markets, which is that markets are pricing in future activity. And I don't know anyone who believes the vaccine is going to be widely available and we're all going back to complete normalcy here any day. Markets know there's still a little process to carry out. But to be very candid, markets are blown away by the speed and efficacy by which this vaccine has gotten here. And now, not just here in one front, but maybe two or three or four fronts. Let me, let me give you a little, if you don't mind, Scott, I'm sorry for the long answer. I'll unpack that last comment a little more. Both of the Pfizer-BioNTech uh, treatment of last week and now the Moderna one today are driven by what's called a messenger RNA um, uh, approach in, in their technology, mRNA, which basically seeks to sort of create a genetic material that then is used to kind of... Um, simulate a, 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 a viral infection, and then it creates the, the uh, antibody. And it's kind of the body, it's tricking the body to fooling itself and then, and then be giving that kind of resistance. And it's proven with these first two treatments to be very successful. But it requires a temperature storage that is very complicated. Well, one of the reasons that um, this is now gonna become competitive and people may not like the idea of talking about life-saving in a, in, a, in a competitive environment, but this is where I think it's really wonderful to be part of a free market system and also to be part of a system that has this much level of innovation and, and, and different uh, talent pool on a global basis. The, the Pfizer-BioNTech treatment has to, first of all, need, it's a two-dose. You have to take it twice. 
and it has to be stored at 94 degrees below zero Fahrenheit. The Moderna treatment can be stored basically at refrigeration level temperature while, while it has to be used, but then on a longer storage, um, about four degrees below Fahrenheit. So that's still pretty darn cold. It's still gonna involve some complexity, but it's a, a much more feasible and more realistic approach. Well, there's room for both of these things and there's gonna be room for other vaccines that come in as well. We still are waiting on more late stage clinical trial results from our friends at the University of Oxford and their treatment that AstraZeneca is a part of. Johnson Johnson is no joke in the vaccination world. These guys are, are dealing with something that will not require two doses, but on a little longer timeline for approval. I really do stand by my belief that we will end up at some point with four or five vaccines of different pros and cons to each one. The markets get to price that in. They get to understand that we're going into a society where there will be a lot of optionality in how we treat this. And most importantly, are able to vaccinate our healthcare workers and um, those that are most vulnerable. And all of that leads to more normalcy and, and really takes the politicians out of the economy, because right now that's the biggest issue that holds the economy back is politicians saying that restaurants have to close at 10 o'clock or 12 o'clock or it can be at 25 percent or 50 percent. And you get this this kind of numbed down economic life out of the politicians, different rules and stipulations as we look forward to what the, the vaccination um, era of the COVID-19 will look like, uh, it's going to dramatically uh, diminish the role of the politicos in all of this. And the headlines back in, in March and April, uh, were many of them were such that a vaccine is not possible this year and that it's going to take several years. Uh, and so just to your broader point about comparing and contrasting kind of where we are now versus where we were in, in March and April. Yeah, yeah, that's right. It's a great point. People were very bearish um, on on the vaccination, and they were, uh, you know, those that right now are bearish on the ability to manufacture and distribute. Um, I think might be under appreciating the um, reality of this Operation Warp Speed that has really put a lot of government dollars into the and and then put a lot of military logistics behind the ability to get this thing out. And almost everything in 2020 since the COVID moment, has, there's all of these different things have been bad. There's been bad things that have happened. And yet pretty much almost everyone has been not as bad as the doomsdayers predicted. And that's really why we're in the situation we're in, that there's more and more economic normalcy, even as case growth is going up, that the economy is in a much better position. God knows the stock market in a better position. Um, and I think most of that is because although it has been a very challenging year and there's so much uh, collateral damage that's been done to different spheres of society, across the board, a lot of the worst case forecast um, have not proven to be true. And the one you bring up is the best example. People that thought a vaccine might not come for five or six years. Um, we need to really kind of maintain a bet, a more realistic vantage point, which in this case, realistic and optimistic have proven to be much more synonymous than the alternative. Yeah, well said. And, and, and you know, when, when it comes to uh, sort of those, those really gloomy predictions, uh, clearly, I mean, it, 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 it affected some investors, right? I mean, we have a question from, from someone who wrote in, uh, who, who sold their portfolio to cash in April. And they're acknowledging they missed out on a lot of the, or really all of the gains that we've seen since March, but they want to know from you how they can get back into the market. Yeah, um, those things, by the way, I mean this real seriously, th those things break my heart um, because it is very difficult. And the fact that by April, markets were already in a much better position than they had been in March and then kind of slowly but surely began that climb forward, didn't really have a negative month through the whole summer. Um, and yet, in this case, it sounds like the person's still not back in. It's that secondary derivative effect that I think is even harder. Knowing that someone may have sold out at or near a bottom is hard enough, 
but then that difficulty of getting back in that is always driven by the worst emotion in investing, which is regret. Um, I think that's really kind of the hard part of market timing. And, and I recall, uh, 12, I guess, you know, 12 years ago or so dealing with this over and over and, and on into 2009, that as I would um, talk to people who came to the Bonson Group interested in our services, but had sold out and ha had panicked at the wrong time, or sometimes had an advisor who encouraged them to panic out. And then now we're trying to deal with, well, I don't want to come back in at the top, but what do I do? And I want to acknowledge the emotion that is behind the question, acknowledge the legitimacy of feeling silly, like what if I get in and the market drops 3,000 points when I come back in, which by the way, right now, 3,000 points would bring you to where we were about two weeks ago. Think about that one. I'm in serious right now. We were 26,200 on October 30th going into Halloween weekend. And, and now we're sitting here just a hair shy of 30,000. So 3,000 points, I don't think anyone wants to put all their money in the market and have it go down 3,000 points. But literally, 3,000 points is what we were a couple of weeks ago. However, the answer and what one ought to do, even while acknowledging the humanity of the question, is they ought to construct an asset allocation with a qualified financial advisor that takes into account their appetite for risk and volatility looks at their income need or lack of income need, their total return aspiration, their tax consequences, and dives into their liquidity need and does a full process around what the portfolio ought to look like. And then whether it is November 1st or November 15th or Dow 30 or Dow 25 should begin allocating into that aspirational portfolio because the right target portfolio is never sensitive to a two weeks here and two months there. Now, would I put every penny into that target portfolio on day one? I would not, but I'd put probably 50% in and then average in the rest in a systematic way. And I'd be averaging in systematically, expecting that to cost me money. More than likely, one will end up at the end of their averaging, wishing that they had been fully invested the whole time. But because of the possibility of big checkbacks that can be emotionally unsettling, averaging in is a risk mitigation tool and that's it. Um, my answer here is very non-controversial and I'm totally, completely unwilling to budge. The right thing to do is create the right target portfolio and go get invested in it. And David, we obviously talked about the vaccine uh, for for this conversation so far. And I, I want to shift a little bit and, and talk about some of the other issues the market is facing, like uh, the possibility of more fiscal stimulus. And I think people would be interested in hearing your updated view on, on when we might get that stimulus package, how big, uh, you know, how much money are we talking about and, and kind of what that means for the market right now. Well, um, I, I don't recall if you and I approached, uh, addressed this on the day after call that we did. I don't think it was out there yet, but I've definitely addressed it in my um, the dctoday.com, my daily market briefing that we do. Uh, Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell has, to my surprise, expressed the desire and even offered the prediction that there will be um, a lame duck session for the stimulus bill. Now, again, there's totally different leverage and totally different uh, political realities now because the, um, a deal had not gotten done before the election. So I do not expect that, that deal, whether it's in lame duck or in Q1 of 2021 after the new House, new Senate and new president are inaugurated, I don't expect that there um, is going to be anywhere near the dollar size on that package that there otherwise might have been when uh, the president and Speaker Pelosi were wanting something together. However, um, I, I don't have any doubt that some bill is going to happen. And I'm a little bit curious as to whether or not it really will get done in the lame duck. I would not bet that it will, but I would not bet it wouldn't. Um, I think that a lot of it will just sort of depend on um, quite candidly, whether or not um, the Democrats think they'll get a better deal into Q1 of 2021 for what they're going for. 
I'm not really sure they necessarily will kind of knowing where the composition of the Senate is. So, uh, and the fact that they even are losing um, a minimum of 10 net seats in the house and, and the basics of what uh, they're going to be able to get are pretty well agreed to. So as far as additional small business relief and a kind of re um, loaded PPP for some of the businesses that are mo on a targeted basis have been most damaged by this. I, I expect that to happen. And I do think it would be really good for the economy, for those businesses, and, and even indirectly for the markets if that got done before the end of the year. But you know, it, it's what, November 16th today? And six weeks in Washington? Uh, I, that's not going to happen if they're not already talking about it. And, and so is the market right now putting that aside? Uh, because as you recall, the narrative a couple of weeks ago was that this market needs fiscal stimulus, notwithstanding the, the actual need that, that, that people and businesses have. We're you know, just talking about sort of the market, how the market is viewing the yeah. stimulus I, idea. You know, yeah, no, I think the markets know one thing and don't know the second thing. What the markets know is that some stimulus bill will get done. The markets are not worried that there will be a gridlock lack of stimulus, that there will be a bill um, but what the markets don't know and can't know, and in fact, what I don't know, is what the final size, shape, and timing of that bill will be. I, th I can forecast, and, I, and if I can forecast it, the, obviously the billions of, of, of movements and markets can do the same. That it probably will not include the same level of direct support to states, cities, counties. Uh, I don't expect that to really affect markets much. Um, I do suspect it will include necessary medical support and ongoing funding around obviously vaccine and equipment distribution, hospital support, things like that, uh, direct support to schools as needed. Um, I think that kind of basic stuff, we can anticipate it being in there. There's a kind of baseline, Scott, to what markets would expect out of a deal. But then the, the more market moving piece that we talk about what's called a multiplier effect where something gets done. And the reason it's stimulative is because for every dollar that was done, it has more than a dollar's worth of impact into the economy. Mm -hmm. And there are things that I frankly think would have had a very low multiplier effect that were in the past conversation about a stimulus bill. And I think there's things that have a very high multiplier effect in there now. And so even though I don't think you're going to get something over 2 trillion, like you were talking about before, I think something between 500 billion and 1.2 trillion with a higher multiplier effect is still going to be received really well by the market. And David, shifting to another topic that we probably haven't talked about in quite some time, uh, tensions between the US and China. Uh, somebody writing in with a question referencing an interview with Hank Paulson on Bloomberg this morning, where he said that Biden has a opportunity when it comes to the US and its relationship with China. And then basically Hank Paulson saying that uh, Biden should not remove the tariffs that Trump had put in place because the damage had been done and the tariffs are actually uh, useful leverage for negotiating with China. And so uh, this person wants to know, is that characterization that simple? And are these tariffs good leverage? And has the damage been done? And, and of course, your broader thoughts on, you know, the outlook on relations, relations between the US and China. Yeah, I would, I would have loved to have heard that interview with Secretary Paulson, because there are very few people on earth who understand China economically and the American business relationship with China as well as the former secretary does. Um, and so it's hard for me to unpack his exact answers not having heard them because there's a couple of things in there I'd really agree with and a couple of things I would just need to understand where he was going with them a bit. Um, yes, the damage has been done that, uh, that you know, is, came about from the tariffs and yes, um, it's highly unlikely that, that uh, President-elect Biden is going to take away the tariffs in one sitting. Um, but I wouldn't say that just because the damage has been done, that means there's no more damage being done. 
Um, ultimately, I suspect that what will happen is the end result will be less tariffs. There will not be more tariffs. And that those things will be really useful to American importers and American consumers, but that um, the powers that be will not want to come out of that with totally empty handed. The tariff thing bothers me a lot, Scott, because I think it's a really big distraction from what I, I consider to be the more important policy issue right now, which is the, um, the total dependency that we have um, on some very key and critical parts of American supply chain uh, on, on manufacturing that is based in China. And whether it's national security or, or emergency um, products that are critical to the functioning of the U.S. economy, I don't know really where um, Biden and his team will take this. I don't really take anything from the campaign seriously, but I actually mean this in an incredibly bipartisan sense. I don't take seriously the critics of Biden who would say that he's in bed with China, um, and I don't take seriously the tough talk from the Biden team about China. I just don't know. I don't really know where it will go. And even if someone can make a credible argument that there's been this or that in the past with Biden around China, that, that is fair enough. It's a good starting point, I suppose. But, you know, it's entirely possible that we're in a different moment now and that there may be a different policy approach to dealing with China. My view would be that the tariffs will come down, but not come down super quickly, and that that will be beneficial to the U.S. economy when they come down. However, the bigger policy priority I would put out is that there needs to be a massive, and I mean like the world's never seen incentive for American manufacturers to re-onshore um, their critical manufacturing, things that have particular sensitivity to American national security and intellectual property and so forth. Um, we should never again go through a period where we can't get um, wipes in a global pandemic because they're, they're stuck, you know, and, and part of the supply chain out in an Asian country. Um, I, I think it's a multi-year process. It's very complicated, but I see that as a much more significant part of the economic either headwind or tailwind that we face in the U.S.-China economic relationship. Yeah, and and, and speaking of of all of these policies, uh, like you mentioned at the at the top of our conversation, uh, you know, we now have a lot more clarity on. I guess the, the landscape of the government in, in 2021, and at least for the next couple of years after that, uh, just curious, uh, your broader reactions uh, on the election front over the past few weeks and, 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 uh, you know, as it pertains to, to markets and the policies that markets care about, like taxes uh, and like regulation, things like that. Well, you know, it's interesting the um, when you say last few weeks, it, it's November 16th. So tomorrow will be the 17th and tomorrow will actually be the two week mark from the election day. And yet it, I think for a lot of people, it feels like it's been a lot longer than that. Um, we know enough right now to say that the, the Senate is going to be staying in Republican control. Uh, we don't know exactly what that margin will be. We also know from at least one or two more moderate Democrats that they have said they have no intention of coming in and voting along the lines of some of the, the bigger concerns the market might have had out on the left tail risk. I speak to um, uh, most <clears throat> uh, explicitly Joe Manchin, the Democrat Senator in the great state of West Virginia. So, so we, we know that there is going to be divided government. And we also know that directionally, um, the Republicans look uh, set to pick up um, at least 10, in between 10 and 15 seats net in the, in the House of Representatives. And so the Democrats majority, they were at 235 and you need 218 to be the majority party. They could, it looks like they're gonna end up with 222 or 223, just four or five seats above that majority. And of course we do midterm elections every two years in our country for the House congressional seats. And so I'm, I would be very surprised if some of those things move really strongly leftward. And that's um, at least when you talk about taxes, corporate taxes, regulation, capital gain taxes, that's pretty positive for markets. 
Um, I need a lot more information in the next four to six weeks, and I'm very confident I'm going to get it as to what the regulatory environment will be out of the executive branch of government. Um, there's been a couple of appointments that have really surprised me in the transition team of President-elect Biden, folks that are, are significantly further left than I would have thought. Um, but, but then the names that are being um, put out there regarding some of the actual cabinet appointments themselves have been more in line with what I would have expected. So I don't think people can overreact to a, a team of advisors. Each cabinet department has like 10 to 20 different advisory names. So once you go through five, six, seven different departments, add the, the COVID advisors and other things, there's a couple hundred names floating around out there. And so someone could take a name and, and say, oh, look, this person's really far left or far right and, and, and extrapolate something out of it that I don't think really necessarily connects. Ultimately, we'll get a little bit better of an idea. I've been saying all along, the day that, uh, that Biden... Uh, announces his treasury secretary name, you'll get a pretty good feel for what he is reading in the tea leaves of what is politically sensible and then also ideologically compatible with the vision he has. Um, so there's definitely question marks that are still out there on the election side, um, what the impact will be, but we just, it's too new into this. Um, and I think it'll be into December before you start seeing more concrete names announced. As far as I know, the only name he's actually announced um, as a real appointment is Ron Klain as chief of staff. Mm -hmm. And that's someone who is his chief of staff uh, for many, many years. So that no big surprise there. And David, earlier you mentioned uh, th this idea of a divided government. And we often hear that markets like gridlock. Uh, but I want to bring up something you wrote in Dividend Cafe, not last week, but the, the, the prior week, uh, that it's an incomplete thought to say that markets like gridlock. Uh, and and I, I'll, I'll let you kind of expand on that thinking, but I, I, that, I definitely think that's a unique point of view on this term that we, this phrase that we always hear, which is that markets like gridlock. Yeah, I think that the markets like gridlock phrase, when it's just merely describing a number of eras in modern American history, wherein there was gridlock, meaning divided government, and out of that we had positive returns in markets, it's descriptive and it's mathematical and certainly historically accurate. But then there's also um, different kinds of gridlock that we've experienced. And that's what I was referring to about the incompleteness of it that um, uh, 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 Tip O'Neill, as a pretty far left Democratic head of the House of Representatives, Speaker of the House in the 80s, and Ronald Reagan as the president, and the gridlock that went on there, that was always gridlock that led to compromise. And it was compromise that both sides claimed they were totally unhappy with, and yet there was landmark legislation that was passed out of it, including a world-changing 1982 tax cut in Reagan's first term, and then a pretty large tax cut that took place in 1986. And that one was a real barn burner getting it there because of that divided government. But then there's gridlock, which I think is more descriptive to the word, which is because of divided government, nothing getting done at all, that's pretty much what you experienced through the whole Trump administration, um, other than the, the tax cut. Um, they're, they're, the margins are so, were so thin uh, in the first two years. There was a couple of things that were able to get done. The Democrats took control of the House in the second two years. No, nothing got done legislatively. Similar in the Obama administration, first two years, some big pieces of legislation done when they had full control of the government. And you got to remember back then they had 59 and in fact 60 senators mm -hmm. where, where the Republicans at their biggest were at a 53 majority. And that looks like it's going to come down probably by one here into the next couple of years. Um, and so, yeah, in the first two years of the Obama administration, they passed Obamacare, they passed their stimulus bill and they passed Dodd-Frank. Republicans took control of the House. And again, there was kind of total gridlock for the rest of it. So um, divided government that leads to compromise is one thing and can be good for markets. Divided government that leads to nothing getting done is another thing. And it can also be good for markets, but it can be bad for markets too. It depends really what you're, you're stuck over um, and, what, and what the kind of lay of the land is. I, I've I hope you're not getting tired of me saying it, but I can't tire of saying it. 
the biggest ramifications of where we are right now in the country politically are cultural. They are a byproduct of um, a really strained social environment and an incredibly divided um, American population. And, and yet, because I'm here to talk about markets and your question is specific to how markets respond to that, um, I think that division ends up kind of holding in place some things. I think it's very important that crazy things on each side don't get done. And that's really what the advantage of divided government has been to keep some of that from happening. But to the extent that if we were in a position where something just plain can't get done that needs to happen, um, I don't think markets would respond positively to that. Yeah, and I guess the polarization of where we are right now uh creates on both sides, to your point, some of those those crazy ideas that, that come about that, that get markets jittery at times, or but at you least- know, get- You know, the only, it's a great point. I guess I would love to add into that. I don't want to be overly optimistic. I'm an optimist at heart, but I'm also painfully aware of the reality of our present political moment. But is there a chance that in the outcome of the presidential race for Republicans and in the outcome of a lot of the Senate and House races for Democrats, that both sides may say it's actually not in our best interest politically to, to dig our heels in around inactivity and inaction, but perhaps it would be beneficial to us to at least posture as if we're trying to go get something done. Um, and then will what they go try to get done be beneficial, be positive? Because by the way, I think we talk a lot and some of the comments I've made in the last few minutes could be misconstrued that way as if getting something done is always a good thing. Getting something done is only a good thing if what you're getting done is a good thing. And sometimes it may not be, but I think that, um, there's a possibility of a kind of realignment of what people believe the political tea leaves are and what their own constituencies are expecting of them in the couple of years ahead. In terms of what we should be watching, I guess between now and the end of the year, and obviously we'll have several more video calls to to kind of debrief about that. But but given how we have a, you know six weeks left in the year, you mentioned cabinet appointments. Watch that. Uh, any more sort of benchmarks that you're going to be looking for, either on the policy front or on the COVID front, or or any of that kind of stuff. Any metrics we should be watching over the next six weeks. Yeah, I certainly do wonder if the um, little dibbles and dabbles with additional COVID lockdowns and, and, and restrictions might be tempting in some places to go further. The, in an almost kind of contrarian or sort of counterintuitive sense, one could argue that there's a greater incentive for some that are leaning that way to go do so because they know the vaccine's coming. So they kind of look at it like, well, let's go ahead and suck it up for a few months and, and it'll be okay. And I think that would be really, really detrimental to, to markets. I'm not seeing a lot of that. I'm seeing little headlines here and there and, and, and posturing. But I think one of the reasons we're not is that the expectation right now for some of those types of movements that could be really economically destabilizing um, are that, you lose the incentive to do it if you have a low expectation of compliance. And I think their expectation of compliance with anything that, that kind of smells or rhymes or looks like more shutdown, uh, their expectation of compliance is rightly very minimal. Mm -hmm. So I'm not expecting it, but I have to watch that. It's an outlier that lingers out there, um, particularly as we continue to see infections growing as a result of the infectious nature of this virus. Um, China stuff lingers out there. We had someone earlier in the call that had sent in a question on China. Um, you know, it was a huge area of policy throughout the Trump administration that had a lot of impact to markets. And there's been very little conversation about it. And, and I thought Biden did a really good job in the campaign of not saying that much about it, but saying enough that kind of, you know, kept everything sort of in check. But, you know, at some point, he's going to have to kind of elaborate on what his China portfolio is going to look like. And so that has the, the potential to move markets. Um, and then, of course, we see how companies have done here in the fourth quarter and earnings season will start in mid-January of Q1. 
And now companies are going to have to start giving some forward guidance. A lot of the companies that have been able to say, look, there's just too much uncertainty and cloudiness around the COVID moment. We'll resume forward guidance when we feel we have a little bit better vision. I think Q1 of 2021, companies are going to have to start giving some full year guidance ahead. That would be market moving as well. And David, I think it's a, a, a good topic to end uh, on another question uh, that, that somebody wrote in uh, asking what books you read on your on your weekend getaway this weekend. Well, it's oh, uh, that's kind of fun. Um, I actually read three books this weekend and all three were just profoundly uh, wonderful. And um, at our website at the Bonson we have a little section saying get smart. And under the get smart section, we have uh, section of recommended reading. And we've done two things there. One is we keep an ongoing log of each month, the books that I'm reading, just in case it's of any interest to people, including the person who sent this question. And then we also have um, uh, the list of books that I recommend, just uh, evergreen books to any investor that are kind of like the, the various sort of, you know, gospel have to read books for a lot of investors. Um, and so that's there on the website. And right now from in November, we posted what I'd read in October. I think there were four books that, that went up about that. But then now in December, we'll be updating what I read in November, which includes these three books that I read this weekend, all of which um, were pretty investor oriented, business oriented. Um, I read a new book that's just come out about the rise and fall of WeWork, the large um, office landlord and, and kind of um, really a sort of tragic American business story. And um, I may get up the time to write a review of the book here in the days ahead. Uh, but then I read, and that's just a brand new book that's come out and I think has really important investment principles embedded in it. And, and really this whole saga will, put, will be a big part of now that we're going into the 2020s, this, the, the last decade, you know, the 2010 decade um, ha, is going to have a lot of incredible moments. And we talk about the first decade of this century is very easy to define when you had 9-11 and you had the financial crisis at the end of the decade, you had the Iraq war. And so there, there were all the things coming out of the technology blow up that define the first 10 years of our decade. But if you look back to the last decade with the Obama years into the Trump years, uh, the market recovering, the Fed, but really there is this whole kind of um, classification of companies that were pre-public companies that most of the attention was centered on. And, and WeWork was one of them. And I think there's just a really, really fascinating lesson to be learned from it. Um, and that was one of the books I read this weekend. The second one was a book by Andy Kessler uh, called Wall Street Meat. He was an analyst at Payne Weber. Kind of interesting, his career evolution. I adore Andy. So if you're familiar with the name, he writes in the Wall Street Journal a lot. But Andy started his career as an analyst at Payne Weber, which is the firm I started at. He ended up becoming a senior analyst and kind of lead banker uh, at Morgan Stanley which is the firm I went to second in my career. And then he left and went and started his own firm, which is what I ended up doing. So his three companies kind of mirrored mine, although in different decades, he started in the mid eighties. And this book was written in 2003. And it was just kind of his story throughout Wall Street, but it took place in a very different era about the relationship between analysts and traders and bankers and kind of the way Wall Street works. And, and he really concludes with principles and lessons that came out of the dot-com blow up, the technology blow up that I think are unbelievably crucial and important about investor responsibility and about the distinction between speculating and investing. And he was writing this, you know, almost 20 years ago. And here we are, I was reading it feeling like it could be applied now. And then uh, the last book was a book called um, The Maker Versus the Takers. And it offers a faith centric view of social justice and a really interesting view about New Testament economic ethics. And uh, I'll definitely be writing a review on that book. So there's my three. And uh, maybe after hearing me talk about the three, you're out there saying, I don't want to read any of those, but um, it, it was, it was what I spent my vacation weekend doing. 
All right. So you read those three books. Did you write any books this weekend, David? No, I did not. I didn't even bring my computer. So any okay. writing that I did was just simply dabbling around on my phone a bit. Um, but I, uh, I did not do any writing, just pure reading and most of all quality time with my beautiful wife. All right. Well, glad to hear you had a good uh, relaxing weekend away from the devices. Yes. All right. And David, I think that's a good place to, to leave our conversation for today. And, uh, and I'll, I'll toss it back to you with any closing thoughts. And uh, thanks again for uh, your, your insights. And it was great to be with you as always. And thank you, Scott, of course, for, for joining us and driving the conversation. And uh, for those of you listening, please do make sure you're subscribed for the dctoday.com, that daily bulletin, all the up-to-date market info. Uh, we will, if you join this call late or miss part of it or want just the replay for your own purposes, they'll have the replay posted here in due time. Um, but we started the call about uh, 50 minutes ago. Market was up 340 points and we're finishing the call 50 minutes or so later and the market's up 340 points. So there we go. Um, Thanks. Uh, please do follow up if you have any further questions. We're, we're here for you. And because our next call will take place just after the Thanksgiving weekend, I will give a early uh, best wishes for you and yours to have a happy Thanksgiving. Thanks for joining the Bonson Group. And we look forward to talking soon. Mm -hmm.